Good evening, everybody. Hi. How's it going? Good. My name is Prince Gamovilas. I am the acting director of the Master of Professional Writing program here at USC. For those few of you who don't know, the MPW program is the country's first multi-genre creative writing program where students come here to study fiction, non-fiction, poetry, and writing for stage and screen. And we are uh, particularly interested in the uh, connections between forms. Tonight we are very, very fortunate to be able to host a panel discussion on writing the literary essay featuring uh, four local writers with national reputations who continually draw from Los Angeles as a source of inspiration. Uh, Tom Bissell, Linnell George, David Eulin, and our moderator, Dinah Lenny. Uh, the discussion tonight will be followed by a Q&A with you, the audience. Uh, and after that, we'll have a lovely reception uh, right here. Uh, and the panelists will be happy to sign uh, books, which incidentally are on sale in the lobby. So um, please buy and buy lots and multiple copies for your friends and family. Um, before we get started, if you all could take a moment to silence your cell phones and other noise-making devices, it would be greatly appreciated. Um, to introduce our panelists, I'm going to uh, hand it over to Dinah Lenny. Uh, Dinah, uh, if you don't know her, she is the author of Bigger Than Life, A Murder a memoir, and she co-authored Acting for Young Actors, a book inspired, of course, by her own career as an actor, including a recurring role as Nurse Shirley on NBC's critically acclaimed series ER for 15 years. Her writing has also appeared in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, written on fiction, plowshares, and many, many, many other places. Please welcome Dinah Letty. I'm on a game, a, a game show. <laughs> you are. I, I, I am. I'm on a game. These are my contestants. Um, so listen, I'm not. I am not going to do to them what was just done to me, um, because you have these trusty programs. So you know where. Here's your trusty program. So you know that that um, Tom and Linnell and David have written between them many books and essays um, and have won many accolades and awards and. Uh, and, and some of you have been reading their work for the last week or so. Um, so I just sort of want to launch in, but I wanted to talk for a bit. Why, why did we call this panel the literary essay? As Prince said to me earlier today, you know, you're going to have to introduce the panel. I, it was, I guess I will have to talk about the literary essay. We called it the literary essay because there are so many different kinds of essays and because this is a, a writing program and we wanted to sort of um, make sure that you understood that our, our primary concerns are literary. But there are indeed many different kinds of essays. Back when I was a student, um, you could study fiction or you could study journalism. So this is no longer, the, although the essay's been around for you know thousands of, thousands of years or just a thousand? <laughs> I think you could say thousands. Thousands of years the essay's been, in fact, you know there are books devoted to this, but, but um, but you couldn't study it, and now you can, and you can study the lyric essay, and you can study the personal essay, and you can study new journalism, and you can, uh, other essays, what other uh, kinds of essays can you study? You can study all kinds of hybrid forms that, that are essayistic. Um, and of course, one of the things that we will undoubtedly get into is whether or not, um, whether or not the essay has to be nonfiction. But I'm not gonna get into that right off the bat, David. Okay. So, <laughs> so yeah. So, um, so, uh, but what I wanted to do is talk a little bit. Um, all three of, of the writers here are also journalists. They've done lots of, of of work in journalism, and so I wanted to start by asking you guys, what distinguishes? Um, what's the difference for you between a personal essay and journalism? Is there a difference? You Tom, look, you want to start? You're looking at me. Can, yeah. every, can everyone hear me? Am I, am I on? You're on. You're I can't. On. Okay. Um, to me, what, what I think distinguishes a piece of journalism from a quote unquote literary essay is the complicated presence of the narrator. And by that I mean it's a narrator who doesn't pretend to be this invisible presence like they do in New York Times pieces. Um, the, the author of a piece of journalism, particularly a piece of straight up newspaper or magazine journalism sort of operates under the assumption that trust has been pre-earned for him or her by the 
gothic lettering that the, the magazine or newspaper that they write for sort of earns them. But a literary essay, you sort of start at a, at a, at a blanker place. You start at a place where the reader doesn't know if he or she is going to trust you automatically. And so you create that trust, I think, with you extend the hand of empathy, you extend the hand of uh, self-deprecation, you extend the hand of carefully wrought detail. But the literary essay doesn't shrink from the narrator being a participant in what he or she is seeing. He, doesn't, he or she doesn't pretend to be an invisible presence, an impartial recorder of things. Um, the literary essay takes it as a given that honest subjectivity is actually what's, what's being explored. And I don't really think there's any real objectivity. I think that the journalist's idea that true objectivity is a desired state is, I think it's kind of farcical and very old fashioned. Um, so honest subjectivity and the complicated presence of the narrator are the two things that mar to me mark uh, a literary essay and distinguish it from journalism. You got, do you want to add to that? You too, Brunel, David? Um, yeah, I'd like to, uh, because I am a I'm a journalist, and I write in um, for various sections across newspapers. So I write hard news, and I've written art criticism, and I've written music criticism, and I've written essays. And in the newsroom, there are several different kinds of essays you can write. There, are, if you're a columnist, uh, essentially you're writing an essay with you as the first person voice. Um, it is understood that it is your opinion. If you are a columnist, it's one of the few places in the paper where people know when they see that columnist's name that that's going to be through their lens. There are other places in the newspaper, um, like in the magazines, for example, where you can write what I love to do, which are reported essays, where you're trying to balance, it's a hybrid, you're trying to balance your reporting with your own voice and your observations. And the reporting actually helps to support your argument or you can argue with the voices in, <laughs> that you have collected through your reporting to, um, make, to deepen the piece in some way, shape, or form. So um, I sort of look at all these different um, places and um, ways I can write as sort of colors on my palette um, so I can stretch out. So if, say there's some story that I have been wanting to go to dig deeper you know, into and um, want to do it in a different kind of voice, uh, I may want to try to do it as a reported essay. So, so starting as a reporter, you started as a journalist, yes? Well, if I really go way back, I actually, when I was in school, uh, I wanted, I was writing fiction, and I didn't intend to be a journalist at all. Uh -huh. and so was it hard for you as a, coming from fiction and then moving into journalism, was it hard for you to find your way into yes. that subjectivity? Um, more, it was harder, to find a voice. I felt, when I first started, I thought, oh, I have to be writing, and when you were talking about the authoritative voice, I thought that that's what I was supposed to be doing. I was supposed to like strip everything away, and I'm just reporting. And what I found um, working with editors, like, no, they didn't want that. With the kinds of pieces I was writing, I was writing on feature stories, and they wanted the flavor of my voice, but I had trouble trying to marry that. You know, it took a, a while for me to feel comfortable, like, oh, I can do that. I can use that voice. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So that was the hardest thing for me. David, talk about finding a voice. Oh, thanks for the easy question. <laughs> <laughs> but well, seriously, as a critic, talk about, I mean, find, how, how subjective are you as a critic? I'm utterly subjective. I think it all, for me it all ties together because I also didn't train as a journalist and didn't. I sort of backed into journalism. Um, I'm so old that when I started trying to sell pieces, someone said, write book reviews, they're publishing them everywhere. <laughs> and seriously, that's totally true. So I started writing book reviews and sending them out, and lo and behold, they were publishing them everywhere. That's really how I became a book reviewer. Um, it was the easiest thing to get published, was a book review. Um, and I have always been a creature of the path of least resistance. So. Um, but I didn't have any journalistic training, so it never occurred to me. And also, I grew up uh, reading all weeklies and, and writing for all weeklies, so I, it never occurred to me um, that journalism shouldn't be subjective and shouldn't be voice-driven, and that the journalist shouldn't wear his or her biases 
even in a reported story on his or her sleeve. When I started writing for uh, mainstream newspapers before I ever worked at the paper at the Times, when I was freelancing, I you know I had to learn the ropes of that too. That writing a feature, an arts feature um, for the LA Times or you know uh, Chicago Tribune or the New York Times was different than writing an arts feature for the LA Weekly or the Village Voice. That that you know there, there were a different set of requirements, and I've always kind of had a I don't know how to call it, sort of a journeyman um, regard for all this stuff. Like, I want to know how to do it all. Like, I want to know how to write a, you know, a hard news story. I'd like to do that. I don't want to do it all the time. Mm -hmm. You know, when the Nobel Prize was announced, and I had to get up at four in the morning and write a hard news story about um, the guy who won the Nobel Prize. You know, I was like, I'm, this is why I, I'm glad to do this once a year to remind myself of why I don't want to do this the other 364 days a year. But I like being able to do it. It all sort of pulls a different muscle. But I think in some ways it all does kind of come from voice. And I, for me, voice is very much um, centered on, or has a lot to do with point of view. It can be a first person point of view in the sense of, like Tom is saying, sort of the narrator as a presence, what Joan Didion calls triangulation between um, you know, herself and the reader and the subject of the story, which I think about a lot. Um, or it can simply be the way your point of view operates. I mean, even when you are writing a putatively objective piece of reporting, um, <laughs> there's no such thing as an objective piece of reporting, right? So. You know, for instance, when I, again, just to sort of talk about that one piece of hard news, when I wrote about the um, Chinese author who won the Nobel Prize, one of the things that interested me and frankly concerned me a little bit about him was that he was a little bit too in bed with the authorities. So I asked those questions when I did my reporting. That was the thing that my natural interest or my natural bent led me to sort of focus my reporting on. And so even though um, the story is theoretically objective, it can, nothing can ever be objective because if you're engaged in your material, you're always approaching that material from your point of interest. And I think that's true of journalism or essay writing. Right, I, I think it was Nabokov that said that everything that's worthwhile is at least a little bit subjective, so. Yeah. And you know what else he said? What? He said literature did not begin um, when the boy came back to the village being chased by a wolf and said I'm being chased by a wolf. He said literature began when the boy came back to the village and said I was chased by a wolf and there was no wolf. <laughs> <laughs> oh great, thanks, just, get, just jump right in. Uh, and David and I have been arguing for weeks now about nonfiction and, and fiction in nonfiction and nonfiction in fiction and we will get to that. I just wanna stay on this thing about voice though for a minute. So um, do, you, do you, when you talk about the different requirements of different kinds of journalism you guys, did, Tom, do, does it affect your voice depending, I mean, are you constructing a different narrative persona according to the, or are you, are you the same Tom running through all these kinds of literary essays? No, um, <laughs> uh, just because, uh, you know, the, the contingencies of publishing sort of determine a lot of that. So I've written three pieces for The New Yorker which is a very different place to write for because they kind of have a state department of style there a little bit where, where um, it would be an over exaggeration to say they beat the style out of you, but they definitely are not there to hear you talk about your personal feelings about what you're reporting. And so when I've done those pieces, I've been extremely conscious of the fact that the story is not about me, it's about the person, all three of these pieces were profiles, which helped. Um, and then you just let the subject and the environment that you're talking to the subject in sort of tell the story itself. And I wouldn't dream of inserted myself in there because I wasn't, I wasn't what anyone was paying money to see. So, but are you there? Are you? Is it implicit that you're in the? Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. I'm, t I'm, I'm, I'm the eye there, but I'm only the eye there as the camera eye. I'm not uh -huh. there as the opinionated eye. Whereas, uh -huh. I've done pieces for Harper's and the Virginia Quarterly Review. Uh, I'll talk about the Virginia Quarterly Review one. I did a reported piece on the Loch Ness Monster, which was an incredibly hard-hitting piece of investigative reporting. <laughs> and the whole purpose of that piece was to put me next to Loch Ness, which is a place that obsessed me since I was a kid. I don't believe there's a monster there. But the whole purpose of that piece was my going there and actually describing what it felt like to be someone who loved this monster, no longer believed in it, and what that felt like. And so you see these two occasions are very, very different things. Mm -hmm. One, I was going to talk to Chuck Lorre, the guy who made Two and a Half Men and, and Big Bang Theory. And the other, I was going to investigate my own personal feelings about this rather mythic, long, narrow lake in the middle of Iberia, right? So, yeah, I mean, you don't have to, it doesn't take a lot of cogitation to just figure out like where the weights and presentation are gonna shift there. And so it's actually a very instinctive thing. And if you have a brain as a writer, you realize pretty quickly when you're the main attraction, when you're like, 
an extra <laughs> and when you're when you're somewhere in between and, and in terms of your comfort zone both you and Linnell can I mean David too can talk about this when you're doing a researched piece how how does that how quickly do you move from one voice to the other how do you know what the requirements are and how do you find that balance Linnell talk about that a little bit in terms of the pieces that um, it, we read here it definitely it it changes with venue, you know, um, who I'm writing for, um, who I expect my audience to be. But often, um, and I have to know if this is a really informed audience, I don't have to go all the way back to A and, you know, really explain a lot of stuff. I, I want to meet them where they are. But if I'm going to be leading them into something that they don't know, then I want to be really aware that, okay, I'm going to have to, that's, Part of what I'm gonna, I'm gonna need to do, and maybe even within the piece, there's gonna be a voice shift because I have to do that. But I wanna do it in such a subtle way that it doesn't, it's not gonna feel so jarring that, okay, she's stepping back now to explain the history of this. So there are th those things that are going on too in my head about like, well, you know, what is this supposed to be? I really, really have to establish in my head before I start anything for anyone, especially for a really long form piece what the mood of the piece is going to be. That's essential. Um, and that's, if I can locate the mood, then I can, then I start to hear the voice that I'm supposed to tell the story in. And so, and, and if you're, this, so you're all talking about writing on assignment. What about when you, what triggers the writing of something personal for you that isn't, I, how often do you not write on assignment, David? What, what would trigger an essay for you? That they read an essay, one of your, yeah. Um, all right, as an example, I went to Texas two weeks ago, and I realized when I got on the plane that I always wear my shittiest clothes when I fly. <laughs> um, no, really, it's like I have a uniform. It's the same t-shirt, the same. Partly it's superstition, and there are other superstitions which I can't <laughs> reveal or else it will invalidate the superstitions. And I'll have to come up with these kind of superstitions. But, but I always wear my crappiest clothes, and I, I think that it has to do with comfort because I hate flying so much, and I generally, you know, <clears throat> I generally dress really well, as you guys all know. Um, <laughs> so I like to be comfortable anyway. And these are old clothes, like they're you know faded, maybe torn a little bit, um, that I've worn a lot, so I feel comfortable in them, and I think that they're related. And so I started actually started writing this essay about this while I was in Texas. Not. It wasn't why, anyway, whatever. But that notion- About dressing on the plane. About, yeah, and comfort, and levels of comfort. And there's a great line in a Don DeLillo play where he talks about how only in hospitals and on airplanes are we polite to each other because we sense the presence of death. And, um, and I think he's absolutely right. And I'm fascinated with those questions of solemnity and fascinated with questions of death. So it became a kind of interesting um, lens to sort of look at comfort and discomfort and um, private space and public space and being on the plane in the company of my own death, um, which is how I generally feel when I'm on an airplane. Um, and so I, but, but to go back to the initial question about voice, I mean that idea just sort of popped up and then it seemed to have legs. Sometimes ideas pop up and they just are stupid and disappear fairly quickly. Like I once wondered what it would be like to be inside a big apartment building when it got tented for termites. Um, but that seems really unworkable as a piece of writing. I don't know how you actually research that piece. Um, so that piece got put, that, that idea got put aside. But it all does sort of come out of the same voice well. And I think that the other part of it, I would say, is that you know when I was sort of, I think all writers have a voice. I think it's like a, a fingerprint or a, um, it's just who they are as a writer. And for me, the big process was accepting what my voice was. It wasn't necessarily the voice I wanted it to be or mm -hmm. the voice that I would have wished it was. It wasn't like the writers I idolized, although it takes some things from them, I think, but um, it was a real matter of coming to an accommodation. This is my voice. I can play with it in certain ways, but there is a kind of way, a natural way that I tell a story um, and it's the same way I tell a story if it's an essay like the one you read or if it's a piece that I'm writing on assignment or if it's a book or um, anything like that. I think that there is a kind of continuity of, of voice. And I don't know where it comes from, but I think for me it was a the big step was, was, was accepting it. So um, I want to sort of talk about this business, Linnell. You, find you, you, you have to have the mood in place first. And, and David, you're talking about sort of getting this idea about um, the, uh, coming from the, the clothes on the plane. Um, I want to talk about how you 
move into the structure of an essay. When does, when does that come into play for you, Luna? Once you've decided that you know what the tenor of the piece is, when does, it, when does the structure take well, shape? Um, if I'm really lucky, it falls out of my head. I think mm -hmm. that's happened twice in 25 years of writing, you know, where it actually, like, boom, there it is. It's, it solved itself for me. Most of the time, I really struggle with structure. Um, that's, I, do we struggle with structure? <laughs> <laughs> I'm moving things around a lot. Um, in journalism, you ha there are certain things. If you're writing a piece of journalism, if it's hard news or feature, there are certain things that have to be in place that editors are expecting to see. And so I at least know, okay, well, that's going to go about here in the column inches, right about there, So because I know they're going to be barking for it. But the rest of it, um, again, probably sort of like the mood thing, it, it sometimes announces itself. Sometimes I do outline, but I don't outline in the way that with the, the Roman numeral and that I, you know, no, nothing like that. I might take a quote from someone that I just have been, it's just been looping in my head, and I'm thinking this is, this is talking to me. So that becomes one of the points in the piece. Um, and then it may be just a list of points that I want to make or quotes that I definitely want to write around. There may be an image that sticks with me. Um, the, in the piece that you read in Slake, that piece really did come out of me being detoured. I did not, was not thinking about writing that piece. I had not been in that neighborhood in a long time going that way. If I hadn't been detoured, that piece wouldn't exist. But it made me start thinking about, oh my goodness, what does this mean? And that's a piece that actually found its own structure because I decided I'm going to pick some streets and I'm going to go drive down those streets and I'm going to go see what happens when I drive down those streets. So that actually, that, that structure came to me you know, naturally. So every piece is different and I try to stay really open to that even, even though thinking that I've got an editor who's going to go, where is that net graph? Uh -huh. you know, where is that net graph? I don't see it. And did the, did the act of the writing uh, also shape the piece for you? I mean, did the writing sort of mirror the, the driving in some way? Or yes, definitely. And in fact, in the original version of this piece, there are two other streets that didn't make it in, <laughs> and in the end. Uh -huh. Because I deci we decided, I decided, and then the editor who worked on it also decided, just this feels connected, but not, it doesn't, it doesn't close a piece out. I have a feeling you need to, I think this is gonna be a bigger piece. So I've, I've held on to those pieces. And it, I think I probably will build a new structure that will contain all of those pieces, all those streets. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, Tom, t tell us about the structure of Escanaba's Magic Hour. How did you, when did you discover the structure of that essay? That's that, um, you guys read it, right? So that's the first reported piece I ever wrote in my life. And I don't know what to say. I, I just went, did the reporting, came home, wrote it up. So you didn't Turned go through multiple drafts? Or no, not really. Are you, are you, does, it, it, does it, that it, happen No, often? no, it, it really doesn't. And it, and it, <laughs> and it um. Because we don't like to hear that. <laughs> no, I thought I was in, I thought I was going to be cruising on easy street with this nonfiction thing. It was going to be really easy, but I mean, that was an exception in that. I think it's one of the rare pieces where I felt like, and for whatever reason, that was like one of these essays that I was sort of born to, to write. I mean, it's uh -huh. not every day you're tiny hometown in Michigan gets turned into a movie, right? So um, I never really think about structure. I just write it, look at it, and then maybe move stuff around. But to me, structure sort of makes itself clear when it's done. Uh -huh. um, and I have one of the most inefficient methods of working imaginable. Um, in my essay collection, the last kind of reported piece I did was a profile of the novelist Jim Harrison. I don't know if any of you guys know him. He wrote Legends of the Fall. He's an amazing writer. So to research that piece, I, I read all, I read a, 12 books that he'd written, reread them, took a bunch of notes, went and did the reporting, took a bunch of notes there, then just wrote a bunch of paragraphs about what I thought about him, typed up my notes from the books. So when I was done, I had 128 pages of typed up notes, double spaced. <laughs> That's a bit more than anyone was asking for. <laughs> so I kind of knocked that stuff down to a 32-page essay. 
So then you're just basically doing sculpture, right? I mean, not that my work is, you know what I mean by that. You're yeah. just you're just chipping away. What I mean, and it's so amazingly disheartening. My girlfriend who's in the audience can tell you that when I wake up knowing I have to knock 90 pages out of something, that's not a good morning. But um, <laughs> but I really do feel like when you approach it that way, the stuff that you cut is still there. No one can see it, but it's still there. Like the fullness somehow of the work is there. It doesn't feel thin. And I like essays that feel like there's a lot more than, than you actually wrote in the piece. And so I wouldn't recommend that method to anyone sitting in this room. I really wouldn't, because it's really painful and awful. But I do feel <laughs> like if you're willing to write 100 pages of notes about something and you haven't written like a word of the text yet, you're probably um, committed enough and crazy enough to actually write good essays, because it, that's the kind of just cockeyed, weird, method you have to have sometimes to, 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 some, to do a piece right, I guess. David, you want to talk about structure? Sure. Um, I, I believe in it firmly, but I don't know quite what it is. Um, <laughs> I mean, you know, I know it's there. I don't, I, I don't consciously, let's see how I want to put this. I do structure things um, very actively, but I sort of don't consciously structure them, at least in the early going. I am a writer who, sits down and writes, you know, I mean, I don't have a sense of, I may have a sense that the piece starts here or that the essay starts here or whatever I'm doing starts here. This is true even when I write reported pieces for the paper or book reviews or whatever. I don't, I don't outline. Um, I don't know much more when I start than where I'm starting and then generally kind of, I mean, I've, I've steeped in the material, generally sort of the kinds of things I want to touch on. In the case of the essay you guys read, I had no idea it was gonna and it was gonna go to New York until it went to New York. Um, I thought that I was just gonna briefly have one sentence about New York, and then I got kind of sidetracked into a few pages about New York. Um, that was interesting to me. I it wasn't what I was planning on, um, but it seemed worth going with. That essay also was initially conceptualized as something that I thought was gonna be about 500 words long, just a little riff. Um, and then it turned into something bigger, partly because it went to New York. But, um, but I feel like, for me, the structure has to kind of assert itself in the writing of the piece. And I don't want to make this sound you know, magical or unconscious, because it's not. I mean, that essay, which is a short essay, it's only eight pages long, um, took me about two months to write. So it takes a long time. I go in, you know, I write, I pull stuff out, I put stuff back in. But for me, it's really a matter of kind of just sort of shutting my conscious brain off enough to just go with my instincts and see where they go. Sometimes they lead me astray, sometimes they don't. Um, and so there is a real sense of sort of fortuitousness, I think, to the way structure develops. And then I, um, and then I latch onto it. As another quick example, in um, the book I wrote about reading, I knew very early on that there was going to be a sort of three-part structure, which would have been, we can call thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. But it seemed too linear to me and too on the nose. And I knew I didn't want to write that the book that way. And I couldn't figure out what the structure was. Uh, and then <clears throat> I was sort of, so I think I was kind of receptive to the idea that there was some other structure out there. I just needed to know kind of what the frame was. And then something happened um, that I write about in the book. And, and after that happened, I realized that that was the frame. Um, this thing that happened was my son telling me that reading was dead and literature was over. And I realized that that was going to be the starting point of the book and then the trigger for the book. And there was going to be this other superstructure on top of that three-part structure. But again, it was sort of a matter of just waiting to see what happens. And for me, a lot of it is just waiting to see what happens. So let's, let's talk for a, a little bit about, because I'm still, this thing about structure is intriguing to me. Um, I, I'm thinking now, I don't, you're obviously in the middle of, of writing the essay about um, wearing schlumpy clothes no, on the I'm plane. No, I'm not. I haven't started. I have a lot of notes, but I, I, oh, yeah, I don't have 128 the, yeah. pages of notes. But <laughs> so, I, mean, I think just, I'm going to adopt this strategy. Yeah. So. <laughs> I, that's my strategy, actually. I always have 128 pages, always. But, uh, but, but David, so you have it. I want to talk about the difference between essay and memoir, and the idea that you're you're going to explore this idea of comfort, um, maybe a, 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 the larger idea of comfort. St sort of your entry point is the is the clothing on the plane, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, do you want to 
so can we talk a little bit about that? I know I don't know, Linnell, if you think of yourself as a, a memoirist, but is there a difference between memoir and essay for you guys? And what is it? Uh, I, I personally don't. Uh, I've thought about this a lot, and um, I don't. To me, I, I the, to me, it's just just a, a piece of nonfiction. Can this is the wonderful thing about nonfiction? <laughs> Is that if it's not a poem and it's not a story, it's nonfiction. <laughs> and nonfiction can be a hundred, hundred different things. And um, I've, God, I, I had a review once where someone um, critiqued a book that I'd written for being too memoiristic, and I was like, I. I didn't even know it what was a memoir, you know. So is that is that um, are you talking about the father of all things? Uh, is that I mean, do you consider that a, a memoir or a long essay or This is a book about my father in the Vietnam War. He and I went back to Vietnam together. He's a Vietnam combat veteran. And so we went back to Vietnam together. It's a very strange book in that it opens with a hundred page novella of my imagining the night my parents marriage kind of broke up on the night South Vietnam formally surrendered to the North Vietnamese, which my father watched on television. And I kind of only let you know that I'm basically making this up about two pages away from the end of that section. Up to then, you think it's this hardcore documentary recreation based on all these interviews, and it's not. And then that's interspersed with a second part, which is an account of my father's and my trip. And then that's broken up by a third part, which is just kind of an oral history of a bunch of kids whose dads fought in the Vietnam War both from the Viet Cong, South Vietnamese, and American perspective, and the North Vietnamese perspective. So, you know, basically the four sides of this war, just voices, no one's identified, just blocks of people talking. So as I say, it's a strange book. There's a lot of me in it, but there's also a ton of history in it, and there's also a lot of fiction in it. And so I wouldn't begin to know how to even to describe that, and that's kind of why it's, of the books that I've written, it's the one I'm proudest of, because I, you know, I wouldn't even know what to call it. It's just a weird grab bag of non-fictional opportunities, I would say. And um, so, but you would call it, sorry, you would call it nonfiction. Absolutely, um, with a twist. <laughs> um, <laughs> so memoir and nonfiction and essay. I, I think as a for the young writers in the audience, I think you can actually fuck your head up a little bit thinking too much about these things. Mm -hmm. A work of nonfiction is a contract with the reader that what you're telling them purports to be true within the limited context of its presentation. Th that it's true to the experience of the writer, that the facts in it as it represents them are accurate. And that within these facts and within that representation, you're telling them some truth of your existence and how it relates to a literary experience. And so that to me is really the bond between the reader and writer of nonfiction. Everything else is marketing, in my opinion. David and Linnell, weigh in on this issue of your accountability with your readers. Um, I can I can go. Um, yeah, I I I really love what you said about about it about not trying to box in what you because if you start thinking about categories, that's going to so limit what your imagination where your imagination can take you, and um, and blending um, blending genre as long as my reader knows. And it's not, you know, under my byline, the paper is a reported story and I'm making things up. As long as, you know, as long as, long as it's not that, we don't want to do that. But, um, but if I'm, I'm writing in a space that clearly, um, where I clearly let the reader know that, okay, I'm taking, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you on an imagined ride here. And I've done pieces where I am retelling history and then I start to wonder, well, what if? You know, what if this happens? And so the floor falls out for a little bit. And but I'm taking the reader with me. And then we come back out. Um, but there was something else, um, Dinah, when you were um, talking about just kind of going back and forth and making decisions. I wrote a piece last year, um, and it took me a while to write it, about my mom's books. My mom passed away. And um, it was very difficult. It was a long illness. and. Um, I, it was hard for me to talk about, and it was hard for me to write about, and people kept saying, are you writing about it? I said, no, I'm not writing about it. But what um, happened was, I happened to be going through her books, 
because I was going to make my mom's from New Orleans and I wanted to make gumbo and I wanted to make it she didn't really use a recipe but I wanted to have a guideline because I was sort of rusty and I start going through the books and I noticed that she had written so much in the books and then I would pick up another book and you know Christina Rossetti <coughs> poems and she had written a, a ton of stuff in these books and then I was finding old transfers from streetcars in New Orleans from the 40s so the book, the piece, I, couldn't, I still couldn't figure out what kind of piece I wanted to write. And so I just put it away for a long time. And I know I talked to David about it really early on. And he said, oh, you know, if you want to talk to me about it. But I couldn't even talk about it. And finally, um, it just started to announce itself. And I wrote a piece that I think, again, which is probably not the full piece, but I wrote a big piece. And then when it came time to run it in the paper, um, and it ran in the Times. Um, the book editor at the time um, kept saying, well, we should call this a memoir. I said, but why? But why are we calling it a memoir? I've, I've written first person essays before. I said, I'm not sure if it's a memoir. I don't know if it's a piece of a memoir. And he was saying, but it's a memoir. It's a memoir. I said, but I don't know what it is yet. You know, it may end up being a lot of different things. So, um, I think we did not end up calling it a memoir. Um, I don't think we did either. No, I, I can't remember what we ended up doing with it. But I kind of like the fact that it was, because of the way it was structured, it could have been, because I was doing what ifs at the very end, uh -huh. you know, and I was imagining what all these little pieces that I was finding inside the book. Here's this woman who I didn't know yet, and I saw her as a teenager on the streetcar in New Orleans, with her shopping lists and you know it just so it could be anything I think I think that what if question is the key question yeah and that's the question that I'm always asking I mean for me one of the things that I like about <clears throat> nonfiction writing or that it attracts me as a writer to nonfiction writing is that I don't know what it is and I often don't know what it is when I'm sitting down to write it um, and so I feel like the form has to get invented fresh each time out whether it's for an essay whether it's for a book um, whatever it is that's sort of great. It's sort of scary too, but it's sort of thrilling because I feel like we're kind of inventing the form as we go along. Um, and so I'm drawn to that. I like that idea. I mean, as I've, you know, I've said it before, I like that idea of blurring lines and blurring boundaries. I like that idea of walking into a territory, <clears throat> whether a narrative territory or a structural territory or a genre territory that I don't quite know what it is that I can't explain. Um, and so that's true for me too. I mean, when I'm sitting and writing, I mostly write in this form. When I'm sitting and writing, I'm not really thinking of what it is. I'm thinking about sort of what is this, what it, well, what is it that I want to say um, and how do I want to say it? And so for me, it's always a mix of things. It's partially some kind of personal experience. It's partially, um, I draw a lot on reading. Almost all of my essays draw on reading because I spend most of my time reading. Um, I, <clears throat> I, you know, there's some kind of, meditations or sort of reflection, let's call it. Um, I like to do reporting. Actually, I don't like to do reporting. I like to have done reporting. I hate actually reporting. Um, but I like the information or the immersion that that reporting gives me. Um, I like, I do like the sort of the permission reporting gives me to ask whatever impertinent questions I want to ask without feeling self-conscious about it because I'm just the reporter. Um, and the access it gives me, although I also think that that raises certain issues of um, potential betrayal, depending on what you want to do with that, with that access. But all of those things kind of come together in different ways, and I don't really think about it consciously um, in terms of what it is. I just sort of see how it fits together and, and how the story um, needs itself to be told. And I do think, and I say this both as a writer and as a critic, that a lot of these labels that are created are simply shorthand for lazy critics so that they don't have to actually, actually wrestle with what it is they're, um, they're reading or seeing or listening to or whatever. They can just group it into this. Graphic novel, memoir, um, you know, sports book, whatever. Cultural criticism, a great umbrella phrase for everything. <laughs> everything that doesn't fit into another umbrella. Um, but I think it's actually much more interesting not to know. So I, I'm curious to know um, how much of this sort of 
want, having to discover the way the work is going to shape itself and, and, and the voice that you're going to tell the story in and how you're, I mean, you said at one point that your voice is your voice and you had to accept what it was. But I wonder. It wasn't um, William Faulkner. It wasn't William Faulkner. <laughs> I'm still, I'm, I still I, resent that. But, but, <laughs> and, but, but by the same token, you've all talked about how the venue can kind of uh, affect your voice and inform the way you tell a story. I'm just wondering, um, for your own work, as, you, as you're doing this kind of investigation, as you're letting your imagination work, how much does it have to do with who you're talking to? Who the, do you have an ideal reader in mind? Do you, I know for me, um, when I don't know how to tell a, a story, when I don't know how to essay, it helps me to sort of think, well, the person that I'm trying to tell this story will sort of um, architect my voice and my strategy in some way. Does that, is that true for you? Do you have an ideal reader, Tom? Uh, I will quote Anthony Burgess, who said his ideal reader was uh, British, middle-aged, colorblind, auditorily biased. Um, he was <laughs> describing himself. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I don't have an ideal reader. I, and this is going to sound like lame, but I, I just write the kind of piece that I would want to read. Well, I, I think that, yeah. That's, I, that's I, I know somebody, I was telling David this, I have a friend who said that she writes for a younger slightly happier version of herself. <laughs> <laughs> I write for a more muscular, um, <laughs> heartier version. No, no, I mean, look, I've been reading my whole life. I think I know what good writing is. And if I can read it as a reader and not think it's shit, I think I'm, I'm probably doing OK. I think that's really And I would encourage pressure. all of you guys to just put your faith in yourselves. If, if you can read what you're reading, and like recognize when you're doing something right. And when if you can't recognize when you're doing well and when you're not, you've got, that doesn't mean you're not good, but it means you've got bigger problems to get over until you're going to be a pro. You have to be able to recognize, oh, that's good. Stop there, move on to the next thing. And if you can't do that, there's a block in your head that you need to blow up. <laughs> and, um, and so if, if you can please yourself as a reader, you're you're, you're, you're doing well, or you're deluded. <laughs> <laughs> but, but saying stop, that's enough, that's good, that's very different from knowing when you've gotten to the end of something. Do you, are you always clear about when you've gotten to the end of an essay? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it doesn't mean you're done done, but... Um, but you know where the end is. Well, Because endings are hard. Well, the piece, I'll tell you a very quick story. Um, quickly, I, I did a reported piece from Iraq uh, for six weeks in 2005. And there was this amazing moment. I, I, you know, when you're doing a piece like that, every experience feels so weird and intense that you don't really know what the end is. And one night, I was sitting with uh, with a Navy doctor on this little camp with some other guys, and uh, it was sundown, so they were taking the American flag down. So he's taking it down, and then we do the thing. We're folding it, blah blah blah, and then uh, you know he hands it to me. I put the flag down. Then he starts lowering the Iraqi flag. The, of, the, of the newly installed government there. So I'm waiting for him to hand it to, to me, and he takes it and he bundles up into a ball and he throws it on a chair. And I kind of look at him, and he looks at me, and he realizes, oh shit, I just did that in front of a journalist. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, we don't usually fold that one. <laughs> and the minute he said it, I said, that's the end of yeah. my article, oh, and it was. Because to me, it just spoke volumes about what was going on in Iraq at that point and our stated reasons for being there and what the guys who were actually fighting the war actually felt. So sometimes in a reported piece, you just have to be able to recognize, oh, that's the end. Uh -huh. That's the end. Um, and, and I would say, just to quickly jump in, I think it's true of reported pieces, but it's, it's really a matter of just paying attention. Like when you get the gift, which it is in a certain way, of, that, of, being, of witnessing that scene, and hearing that line, you have to know, you know, you have to, you're, you have to be paying attention to the point where you know that's it right there. And, you know, that's happened to me with reported pieces and also with essays too, where something happens and I know this is the end, this is where it's gonna end. I gotta figure out how to get there uh -huh. sometimes, but I know this is, this is the punch I want at the end. And I'm always grateful, A, when it happens, and B, when I'm clued in enough to recognize that it's happened. Um, I have a question for Linnell, but David, before I ask, I just want you to tell them about your ideal reader. Oh, I, I made the mistake of telling Dinah that my ideal reader um, is actually someone I used to be friendly with who I don't, I'm not friendly with anymore, and, and, and I kind of write 
with that person in mind. Um, partly because, largely because I'm petty, and you know, I think I'm also driven by um, rage, by negativity. And, you know, I don't know about rage exactly, but sort of negative emotion and negative. Um, it's not about yeah. It, it, there's some there's some weird psychological thing going on there. But the, it, I don't always I don't always or even often write with this person in mind. But if I ever do write with, and most of the time I don't write with any audience in mind because I was also telling Dinah that the idea that anything I write that there might be a reader, that there might be a moment of public consumption while I'm writing is paralyzing. After I've written, no problem. But the, like, to actually sit at the desk and think, oh, somebody's gonna read this, and I really don't know that much about what I'm talking about, that makes me wanna stop. But once in a while, I write with this person in mind, um, just as a way of um, saying so there. And, and, and you know, I, and it strikes me, uh, you know, I'm not, I, I, I won't therapize here, but it, it's, it, it's, it seems to, it would raise the stakes, you know, in terms of how smart am I, how good am I at this, how, how can I impress even somebody with whom I, I don't have a, a, a wonderful rapport, or whatever, you know what that I mean, in terms it. of just being as smart as you can be, writing is a performance, and you want to give your, you want to impress, you know, everybody, including the people that hate you. <laughs> but Linnell, one thing I actually would like to add yes, to this, and now I want to ask you something. Okay, okay, all right. Um, is that, and it just thought it was important because um, I about audience. Is that if I thought <coughs> too much about who was reading it, sometimes I probably wouldn't go ahead and do the kind of piece that I'm going to write. Right. And I often get pieces that are incredibly difficult to write about hot button subjects in the moment where everybody is the most angry. Um, and I'll never forget, I was getting ready to um, go to Paris. <laughs> I was like, yeah. And then I'm sitting in the cafeteria, and I'm going to leave the next day, and I see my boss walking across the cafeteria toward me. And I thought, oh gosh, no, please, no. And she's like, Linnell, I'm sorry. Um, the jury on the O.J. Simpson trial, they have come to a decision, and to a verdict and um, you need to be ready to write a piece explaining what happened. I'm like, well, nothing's happened yet. Like, well, what happens? When, when it happens, you need to be here and ready to do it. And I'm like, okay. And I'm going to be writing this piece for a million people, literally. And, and a bunch of editors are going to be on top of it. It's, so it's not just my section editor. It's the, it's the, the, the news editor, the A1 editor, and the editor-in-chief. And he's the one that asked me to stay. So I couldn't go. And I remember one of my colleagues saying, I don't know how you do these pieces because, I mean, I would be afraid to write about the things that you're writing about. I mean, you know, what would people say? And I said, I can't think about what they are going to say. I have to write the best piece I can. I have to tell the truth. I have to get the truth, or, uh, uh, sorry, as close to the truth as I can. And I have to be really careful with my, all of my um, contacts and all of my sources. And then I'm blending it into a piece that actually ended up being more of an essay, a reported essay, about how the city of Los Angeles was feeling right now. So it was weird. And, um, but to take the pressure off, I don't think about the audience at all. I just think about what I have to say and what needs to be said. So, so there's writing for an audience, and then there's um, sort of determining how to get at something. And the, what I wanted to ask you was, mm -hmm. I, obviously you didn't, so you wrote the, o, the O.J. Simpson piece to get to the truth. I love the way you, you said that, um, phrased that. But when you were working on the piece about your mother, and after I ask this question, I'm going to open it up to all of you. But when you were working on the piece about your mother, I just wonder, um, you know, this piece that was, w w was neither essay, nor memoir, nor cultural history, nor, I mean, but, but all, some blending of all these things. I'm thinking of a book um, called Missing Lucille by a wonderful writer named Suzanne Burney that is like that. It's, it's a, um, a book that sort of draws all these threads together. And in that sense, I think of it as a real essay in the, mm -hmm. the original sense of the world, as, you know, a try at figuring mm -hmm. things out from various angles. And I just wonder, um, and this is, you know, a personal question, I do that, but how much did you <laughs> write, how much was it writing that, how much were you writing that piece for your mother? How much of it was getting it right on that level? Um, I know Suzanne Burney was definitely trying to, uh, to, um, 
conjure her grandmother for her father. That was her, that was the thing that sort of drove her. And I wonder what drove you in terms of getting it right and getting to the truth of that very personal piece. I mean, I guess in a way I was trying to, I don't know so much if it was honoring her as much as it was what she instilled in me. You know, that she was an English teacher, an avid reader, and um, I watched that growing up, and I really grew to, I mean, books were an incredible, imp incredibly important part of my life ritual, you know? So she took a book everywhere, I took a book, I wanted to be like her, I, I took a book everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I was really trying to get at is probably reanimating what that experience was like for me as a kid, and what was the key was when her friends started calling me uh -huh. and saying, you know, your mother would be so proud of you, and that was not on my, that wasn't in my head, but I, but really I did kept, I was just kept trying to get back to, what did that feel like being in the room with her with a book? What did it, you know? I just was trying to, I was, it was like photographs. I was in my head creating photographs, which I was trying to write. Uh huh. So it's getting, getting it right. Well, memory and imagination are actually much the same thing, mm -hmm. aren't they? Mm -hmm. So um, I would love to open this up to, to you guys. Do you have, and are we passing them? Do we have to pass the mic around? Do you have just repeat our question. Okay, that's what I'll do. So do we have <coughs> questions for our essayists? You guys? Yes, please. I have two questions. One for you, one for Tom. Uh, you pose the question, when do you know you are done? And my question back to you is, do you mean done making your argument, at which point you change the writing piece, or are you, do you mean done shaping the whole piece, including having to change your mm -hmm. argument? Um, well, I, the question was, when, it, what's the difference uh, did I mean when I asked about when you know you were done, if I, did I mean done making the argument, assuming that the piece is in some way a, an argument, um, which many pieces are, or did I mean the, the entire shape of the piece? And I actually, um, I, I meant that I, I, I was interested in knowing about the shape of the piece, um, the, the sort of, that the whole works and that, it, that it's satisfying for writer and reader, um, and also, I was very specifically talking about, you know, I know that I and many of my students have a problem with endings, where, you know, it's hard to, to find the end. And I think um, what David and, and Tom said is really true, um, that, you know, it's usually there. It's usually, if you're, if, you're, if you're willing to be patient or if you're listening, if you're, if you're present, the ending uh, manifests itself in one way or another. So that's what I meant. And your question for Tom? Um, in your piece where the soldier at the end crumpled the erection flag and just threw it there and you found, you felt that was the ending of your piece, do you step back as a reporter and consider that, one, that that could have repercussions that could affect a whole nation where people in other cultures could read it and assume that that represented the whole American feeling and not necessarily the feeling of soldiers in combat, having been a soldier for a number of years, who tend to be more jaded, especially when you're there putting your life on the line. Um, do you have, have I made my question kind no, of? No, no, so totally. His question me, is, did I think about the repercussions of re uh, representing this man in a way that possibly misrepresented his feelings about Iraq? Or um, I did think about that a lot. He was not named. Right. Um, I did not name him on purpose because I know he would have gotten in trouble had I named him. Um, I think the piece was a balance between soldiers that um, who were not uh, colored as villains in the piece and soldiers who were um, colored as having a bit more callous feelings toward the people that they were there ostensibly to protect. My father's a Vietnam veteran. I've thought about this question a lot about soldiers and how you fight an occupation war when most of the soldiers fighting the war have resentment and sometimes even hatred for the people whose government they're supposed to, you know, be protecting the sovereignty of. It's a weird, gnarly question. So yeah, I did think about it, but I thought the greater truth of it was that most of the soldiers that I encountered, I was not with soldiers, I was the Marines, most of the Marines that I encountered in Iraq expressed emotions ranging from contempt to disinterest in the Iraqi people. 
And so that experience was true to what the soldiers had told me privately, and, and I felt that it was not a malicious or an inaccurate representation of the feelings of the soldiers I was with. It was perfect, but to be and, uh, yeah, it's, it was more about the soldiers' feelings than necessarily a comment about it. To me, it expressed the – well, we don't have to get into a political it, it, right. To me, it, dis, it discussed the disconnect between America's stated motives for being in Iraq and what the people actually fighting the war felt. And it was a poetical and even elusive and, – and it didn't have me to step forth and say, hey, there's this weird fucking disconnect. <laughs> um, it was actually a thing I saw someone actually do that expressed it for me. So, I, But I did think about that, and I didn't name him on purpose, even though the, edit, the magazine's editors asked me to. I didn't. Um, uh, it's in Harper's Magazine. You have to have a subscription to, to access it, though. Other questions? Yes. Autumn. Hi. My question is um, for those of you all who really work for newspapers, and I'm sure that you're not always in a major environment, whatever, these days. But um, how do you deal with distractions writing across different forms, both in the, the different works you do, books, reviews, you know, stories, and distractions if you are in that newsroom or live environment, say you're in Iraq and, you know, writing in that environment? How do you channel yourself to focus on the story at hand with everything else? So in this very distracting world, um, the question is, how do you deal with distraction when you're writing in a newsroom? How do you deal with distraction? I'm assuming, distra how do you deal with in distraction different yeah. in different yeah. forms? How do you, what if you're writing more than one thing at a time? How do you deal with that kind of distraction? What if you can't get offline? <laughs> no. well, how do you deal with distraction? Uh, the first rule of dealing with distraction in a newsroom is do not go to the newsroom. <laughs> <laughs> Um, never write. I never write in the newsroom ever. I mean, I shouldn't say never. Once in a while, I get. I have to write in the newsroom if I'm happen to be there, and they and there's writing to be done. But for the most part, um, you know, the irony of newsrooms is that at least for what I do, they are probably the single worst place to get actual reading and writing done. So I read do almost all, all of my reading and writing at home. Um, as far as the other question goes, or the other part of the question in terms of moving from form to form, I like it because I think that I have um, sort of a form of adult ADD, so it's, it's easy. I like to be distracted, or I, I shouldn't, I like to be sort of focusedly distracted in a certain sense. <coughs> I like to have a few things um, going because I like to do, you know, I like to work on this today and this tomorrow. I don't generally work on more than, I mean, I, I'll sort of have a few pieces on the cooker um, at the same time, you know, maybe especially if I'm writing a book, I often sort of pull out to write short pieces because I like having something that I can finish. Um, in the middle of a book, it feels like the, you, I mean, whatever, the middle of the book feels like you're never going to finish and you're never going to finish well. So it's always good to have something to pull out of. But when I'm really going on something, I really only work on that because I can't focus on um, multiple things at once. Uh, multiple sort of big things at once. Uh, but I like having a kind of, what would you call it, like a portfolio of things, just again, because I, it, it's useful to move around. If I get stuck on something, I can move on to something else. It's also one of the reasons I um, like balancing writing and teaching, because it's two different things. They sort of support each other and reflect each other in many ways. They both kind of talk to each other. Um, but it's great to get out of the room. Um. I did write in a bullpen, which is what we call the newsroom, and it's hard. It's really, really, really hard. Um, what I did was I bought earplugs, and I had noise-canceling noise headphones. <laughs> and between the two, I could keep the noise out. It also, because the other thing that happens in the newsroom is people are wandering around to find a conversation. Oh, you're not busy. And so they come and they'll plop down, and so you're on, and you're on deadline. Um, so that's what I do because it would also it would signal that I was busy. And you never make eye contact. No, you. you keep your head down. It's like riding on the subway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that that for that and for the um, I also like having like a lazy Susan of things to be working on. So I keep a story list going. Um, I I it's very difficult for me to write two things at once. But I can be in different places in three or four stories. So I can be reporting on one story, I can be finishing, uh, fine tuning a story, and I can just beginning, be beginning to think of a lead for another one. But I cannot be writing, writing, deeply writing, 
two stories at once. But I can keep stuff going and make sure that my editors know, oh yeah, I'm busy. You know, I've got, you know, I've got this coming and I, I know I'm going to go out and meet so-and-so, and, but you'll have that story by the, the other story by the end of the week. But that's the way I can keep John uh, I, I'm a mess, basically. Um, <laughs> And I'm, I'm, it's not a joke. I mean, it's, uh, I, I need total solitude, complete silence. And if I wake up in the morning and I have dinner plans at 8 p.m., I'm not going to write that day. Um, because the clock is ticking, the clock is ticking, the clock is ticking, the clock is ticking. Oh, my God, it's noon. I only have, because I have to start getting ready at 6, and then I have to drive, and then, oh, God, it's suddenly 3, and I haven't really done Fuck it. I can't. I cannot focus. So for me to get, I have to wipe the slate clean of days. So I didn't really work much at all today because uh, <laughs> thank you for ruining my work day. Thank you for taking food out of my unborn children's mouth. Thank um, you so much for joining. <laughs> so if, if anyone else is like this in the audience, you're not alone. Um, uh, and to me, to get anything done, you kind of have to be alone and quietly miserable. <laughs> The question is about process and discipline. Individual. Tom has told us. <laughs> no. um, I I got to pay college tuition starting next year, so that's where my discipline, a lot <laughs> of my discipline, comes from. Um, so, and that's actually true. Like, I one of the reasons which we haven't really talked about, but one of the reasons that I became. I sort, as I said, I kind of backdoored into journalism, but I did want to be a working writer from the time I got out of college, and I did want to make my living as a writer, and I did uh, everything I could to try and figure out how to do that. Um, one of the reasons why was that I didn't want there to be a disconnect between how I was feeding myself and, you know, potentially at that point now, really my family, and um, what I cared about. I didn't want to be, there's a great interview with John Irving where he says, you know, when he was a school teacher and he was writing The World According to Garp for an hour in the morning before he went to work to be a high school English teacher, um, he said it was like being a doctor for an hour, right? It's like, you know, no doctor would have office hours from 8 to 9 a.m. and then go be a school teacher. Um, and he wanted to be the doctor full time. That was what he wanted to do. And I did too, and it was less important to me necessarily what that was, although it was important to me what that was, as to kind of function in that world. And then I think I'm, I'm not inherently a disciplined person, but I was a freelancer for, uh, a full-time freelancer for almost 20 years. And so I had to learn how to be disciplined um, from doing that often, many of, m many of those years with little children in a small apartment uh, making noise. In fact, um, you know, one of, a friend of mine just was telling me, she remembered this story when my oldest kid was really little, like two, I walked into his room one evening and he had this little electronic Rolodex I had given him that looked like a computer and he was banging on it. And I said, what are you up to? And he goes, I'm on deadline. <laughs> 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 and then I started saving money for therapy. But, um, but I, I think that discipline comes out of the work and I think that there is that. The other thing I'll say about it, and this comes back to sort of knowing when enough is enough, is that I think there is also a quality of knowing that you've worked really hard on a piece of writing. I think this is true of stuff that, for me at least, stuff I'm doing on deadline and also stuff that I'm not, stuff that I'm doing for myself. But that I've worked as hard as I can on a piece and I've gotten it into the shape I can get it into and now I need to cut it loose and move on to another piece. Partly sometimes because there is a deadline clock ticking and someone's pulling it out of my hands and saying we need it. And partly also because it's just time. We do the best we can, these things are what they are, and then we move on to them. And for me, one of the things that discipline has really helped me do is undermine a kind of um, a kind of counterproductive perfectionism, um, which I'm also prey to in the sense that it's okay, it's time. And I think that that's really useful. It's time in terms of deadline, it's time in terms of having other things that I'm working on, other projects I wanna, um, I wanna do, it's, it's, it's time. Um. Yeah, so two hours a day, six hours a day. It's whatever the story requires. Yeah, I mean, for journalism, it's, 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 you may get a call Sunday night and have to start on something. 
is due the next day or the day after. And it requires, you know, this deep focus. And my friends, the, my closest friends completely understand if I call up and go, I can't come to dinner. Oh, deadline. Yeah, I just got something. And I have to write through it. And just like you, if I have plans at the end of the day and I'm starting the beginning of a piece and I know my deadline is the day after the day or two days and I start to get worried and nervous, like that's not enough time, maybe I have to cancel everything because I want to be able to make that deadline. And I want to, I want to write where I have enough space at the end to polish. So I can, I can gun through a piece, you know, I can crash a piece, but I want to have the time to polish it. And um, at the end, and that's the part I really like. Um, but yeah, you could just be on a piece all day, and then the next day, it depends on the length. But usually, from the reporting to the final piece, depending on the length, maybe you know it'll be three hard days of just crashing it, and and that may be hours with a you know four or five hours, six hours with a break to you know grab something and then do something else. But um, and. We didn't even talk about transcribing hmm. the interviews, which is just the most horrible, awful thing. Like, are Cast, they done yet? Cast, <laughs> castingwords.com. Okay. They do, it, they do it for you. Okay. Thank you. I'll come and talk to you afterwards. It's actually great. Yeah, because so, it's my horrible. <laughs> Tom, say you have that whole long stretch of day in front of you and, or, or week in front of you. How many hours a day are you actually writing? I think that's the question. Uh, I'm what's called a burst writer, so I might go 10 days without writing a word, and then I'll go three days in a row writing 20 hours a day. It's not very efficient, but um, I may really believe this. If writing is a pain and you don't want to work, you shouldn't. I mean, Norman Mailer said the difference between a writer and a dilettante is the writer writes on days when he or she doesn't feel like it. And I've really tried my whole life to embody that. But if I'm just not enjoying it, I'm not producing anything that's going to feel good. So I write when I really want to. And um, I've never had to work on, on like deadline, deadline. I've written magazine pieces on deadline, but like daily news deadline, I mean, I would, I would turn to atoms. I mean, I, I, would, I, would, I would disintegrate. I could not handle that. It would be too much for me. So um, I would encourage you all to try to write every day, but just in my own experience, that it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> you, don't, you don't feel like writing every day. You really don't. And, and, and some, but here's the trick. Here's the trick. Here's the trick. Write when you're not writing. Yes. Uh, Write when you're not writing. True. Just sit there and think about it. And um, I'm a video game critic, believe it or not. And so I spend an awful lot of time writing in my head when I'm, when I'm playing games. I do a lot of writing there. So. We have time for one more. Way in the back there. Moments in the writing where you experience a profound sense of spiritual gratification. I'll start. Yeah, absolutely. Um, to me, there are moments in the writing process where three hours goes by and it feels like 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen very often, but it happens sometimes when you feel like you've really written a paragraph. Um, and I hate mysticism, I'm not a spiritual person but you actually feel like you've reached out into the blackness between you and the universe and you've pulled something back. You don't even remember thinking about what you've got on the page, but it's there. And that's the moment where the, the, where the weirdness of writing is most powerful. And that's kind of the moments that you write. You know, if writing is kind of an addiction, and I'm not convinced it's not, um, you kind of write hit, jumping from those moments of what feel like real communions with something bigger than yourself, to me, at least. I, um, I guess yes too, and I guess I don't think about it, but I realized I've been writing since I can remember, and I've been literally, like I can't remember when I wasn't reading and writing or trying to emulate what I had just finished writing or illustrating my own little books and that sort of thing. But I've been writing professionally since I was in my 20s, and there was one year uh, about four years, three years ago, where I wasn't writing regularly at all, and I, and I felt I was I was depressed, or 
I felt outside of myself. That's probably closer to it. And I couldn't figure out what was going on. And when I finally took an assignment, and, and I wasn't even writing on my own, because sometimes I would you know, start doodling essays and that sort of thing. And when I took an assignment, and, um, and it was something that I really wanted to do, and then I realized this is what it is, that's the problem. I'm, I cut off part of myself. And, um, and feeling that sense of like entering a story and writing in a story and writing in the voices of the people that you are, um, you're writing about and you're pulling them in. And I actually really do like reporting. Um, I sometimes over-report um, because I like it so much because I really want to immerse myself. So when you were talking about you know doing the, the 120 pages, I, I'm guilty, not of quite that long, but I've done it. In fact, I told a friend of mine, I, you know, I had interviewed somebody recently, because I was just so excited to be back at doing this, and I talked to this person too long, and he said, you made a mistake. <laughs> you, know, you, don't, you don't talk that long. I was like, no, I was, knew that I was in a flow. So yes, definitely. And I would say the same. I mean, I um, am skeptical about um, I don't know what I am. I'm, I'm ambivalent about spiritual stuff and mysticism and, and those kinds of things. But I do think that for me, the kind of the weird thing about writing is that if it's going and there's no way to know when that's happening, it it does take you someplace you weren't expecting, or it crystallizes things. Um, and so it is. it can be that paragraph or that sentence, but it's also like that idea, that thing that I didn't realize I was even writing about or that I didn't quite understand, and then all of a sudden I, you know, I get struck. I'm, I, there's that moment where I'm like, whoa, that's what this is about. That's really interesting. Um, and so that's always, I, that may be kind of, um, kind of what you're talking about. But I also think that it is just a matter of, um, I never think as clearly or as well for myself, and you know, that, as I do when I'm writing about something. I, I um, and I've had the similar experience to Linnell, you know, about when was this? Like 10, 12 years ago, Linnell and I co-hosted this radio show, which was a sweet little gig, like 10, 13 weeks or something, and good money and all this kind of stuff. And I was, a, I have, I'm a, a tortured writer. I've, at the time, I was a much more of a tortured writer, and I thought this will be great. I'll get 13 weeks off where I won't have to do any writing because I. You know, it'll take me, it'll be a full-time job doing this radio show, and I'll have an excuse to not write for 13 weeks, so excellent, sign me <laughs> up. And then about halfway through the show, I started to get in, I started to notice that I was in a really, really bad mood all the time. Um, and it was only partly because of the show, I think. <laughs> but, um, you know, snappy, nasty, all kinds of stuff. And after except the Except on the radio. Except on the radio, where I had to be professional. And then... Um, as soon as the show ended, I started writing again, and I felt much better. And I realized at that point that it was, in fact, an addiction. I am totally addicted. Like most addictions, it starts off really fun, and only <laughs> when you realize that you're hooked do you realize that it's completely fucked up your entire life. And, that's, <laughs> that's... and that you're trapped. And that's the, for me, that's the thing. So I do think that, 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 that it does have that. But it is that sense of equilibrium. For me, um, Life without writing would be life without equilibrium. Even if I wasn't publishing, I would be writing. It is the main lens through which I understand the world. And going back even to thinking about pieces that may or may not actually happen, it's just a way of framing experience. So even if a piece doesn't get written, the experience doesn't, to me, doesn't get felt as much when I'm not thinking about it as a source of, of writing. And that was a, just a brilliant gift, that part about fucking up your life for the rest of your life. Um, that was wonderful, David. I, I think that's a perfect place to end. <laughs> you balled up the flag. You I just balled up the flag. Up the flag. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming. That was really fun. I think we're having well, no, a reception now and a okay. signing. Thanks to my essayist.